Hey, Flip Geometry, how you doing? Let's jump back into it. We are in section 2.6 of Bob Jones University Press Geometry, fourth edition, looking at proofs using segments. So we've done algebraic proofs, and now we're going to use these skills in geometry. Woohoo! We're here. We've arrived. This is where the trail gets real, ladies and gentlemen. Let's jump right into it. People often get confused with proofs or get frustrated with proofs because they don't know what to do. And um, there are steps, and I'll give you steps in a moment, but generally speaking, it's a logic puzzle, right? And so you are given a statement, and you say, okay, assume that this is true. Here's this thing. Now I want you to get from here to over there, and I want you to use only things that you already know are true. And things haven't been so you've got to kind of in your in your you brain think of what do I know because of what I've been given and, and what do I know because of what I've already proved in the past the church, like and the how can I use those stepping stones to get from here to there the okay church, there are some general guidelines that help church. you but every proof is going to be different Swing and so um, be okay with it being John weird. That's all right. Okay. Relax about England, the whole the process. You will Bible. eventually start to think this way. And that's part of Sunday. geometry's purpose is not just to teach you about shapes, but to teach you how to think and to teach you logic. Um, when you leave geometry, you should be better at making arguments and demonstrating true statements than you were before. Okay, so here we go. Um, some steps. Identify the premise, the given information. What have they given you? And you don't have to prove that. That's just given to you, handed to you. What is that? Identify the conclusion, what you're trying to prove, where you're trying to go with this thing. And make a sketch to understand you under to make sure you understand the theorem. That is the most important thing. People often come to me and say, Mr. Ali, I don't know how to do this proof. And I ask, where's your drawing? And the, the first thing you've got to do after you say, here's where I am, there's where I'm going, draw something because geometry is visual. And if you don't have a picture, you're lost already. Make sure you do a drawing. Now that you have a drawing, consider the things that you know about that situation. What properties, postulates, definitions um, have you already proven or have you been taught that apply to this picture, this situation, right? And you might even need to start just by brainstorming. Hey, I know that this is a midpoint. What do I know about that? Well, this thing is equal to this thing. Um, and start just kind of brainstorming. And maybe you have a piece of scratch paper where you, you brainstorm on a piece of scratch paper and say, these are things I know. And then perhaps just by the brainstorming process, you'll go, oh, look, there it is, right? Um, the other thing you might want to do is consider working backward and saying, okay, I'm supposed to prove this. Well, in order to prove that, I've got to know this. And in order to know that, I've got to know this. And you can go backwards. And sometimes that's more helpful than trying to walk forward. But however you get there, you've got to find the connection from what they've given you to where you're going. Okay, that's the main task of a proof. You've seen formats for proofs already, um, but just as a reminder, a two-column proof has clear statements of the premise, what is given, and it'll say given, right? And the conclusion, um, it'll say prove colon this thing. Um, the prove statement is always in your book. I don't feel that you need to write on your um, assignment sheet that you're doing your work on given proof. That's in the book. Start with the given, and when you get to the bottom, that's the proof, right? That's okay with me. Um, and it always has a diagram. Pictures, pictures, pictures. Pictures are important. And columns for the statements and their reasons. So a proof is a reason, uh, a reason to step through an argument. And you have to have a reason to support everything you do. If you don't have a reason to do that, you can't do that. Okay? So always think about why are you doing what you're about to do. So here we go. Let's do this. Uh, we're going to work through an example. Prove that a line and a point not on that line are contained in exactly one plane. This is the expansion postulate, okay? Um, and we are showing that three non-collinear points make a plane. Um, and so, given that there exists a line K and a point P not on that line, let's get from this line and this point to a plane, okay? So, um, we were, were given this information, this is our premise, and this is where we're going. Let's watch an example of a proof happen, okay? Um, so prove that there is exactly one plane Q, you can call it whatever you want, containing line K and point P. And here it is, here's line K, here's point P, 
and this is going to be plain Q. We've got to um, we've got to prove this, right? You will you'll notice that a line um, was just given to you as line K with no points, but it is nicer if we were to start off by identifying X and Y as points on that line. So let's make a sketch and let's think about the sketch and then let's go from there. Okay, so here we go. There exists a line K and a point P not on that line given. That's what they've given to us. So we're gonna we're gonna march from here. Now we already in our diagram already identified X and Y as points on that line. Okay. There, line K contains like two points, X and Y. And we can just say expansion postulate that two points Although define a line. So we created those points. But even though we just created them, you have to tell the reader why you have the right to create those points. Well, because of the expansion postulate, lines contain at least two points. I'm going to give them to you, X and Y. Okay, X, Y, and P are non-collinear. Hey, look at that, X, Y, and P, non-collinear. And that's just the definition of non-collinear points. Oftentimes you can just make a statement and say, because that's what it is, that's the definition of that thing. Okay, so we've gotten X, Y, and P, we've defined that these are non-collinear. Um, now points X, Y, and P determine exactly one plane, and that is the plane postulate. Okay, that a plane is defined as three non-collinear points. So, points X, Y, and P define exactly one plane, Q, and that is the plane postulate. Line K and point P are in plane Q, that's the flat plane postulate, that um, a line and a point not in that line lie in one and only one plane, right? So, they are in plane Q, that's the flat plane postulate, and so, um, I have, well, I've just passed that, haven't I? So, um, this defines what I'm getting to, what I was trying to prove, that line K and point P are in plane Q, right? That's the goal. I got there. Okay. Now, let's move on to another theorem here. Segment congruence is an equivalence relation. Equivalence relation means that things are symmetric, that they're reflexive, that they're transitive. Okay, so segment congruence is an equivalent relation. That's a theorem, and uh, that is something that you're going to use uh, a lot in geometry. So prove the symmetric properties of congruent statements. Given AB is congruent to CD, prove that CD is congruent to AB. This is the reflexive property. And you would initially think, well, duh. If this is the same as this, then I can reverse their order, and that's obvious. And yes, it's obvious, but why? Well, because it's true. Okay, prove it. So, we get to prove this really obvious statement, and it's going to seem like we're dancing around a long way to get from a, a, sh a short a short place to a short place, but um, it's necessary to be able to think this way, right? So. Let's do this proof. Here's the proof, and I'm going to show it all to you at one time because it's really simple, okay? We're going to start with the given. AB is congruent to CD. That's the given. That's what they told us. We're trying to get to that CD is congruent to AB. Well, all you have to do is say if AB is congruent to CD, then the measure from A to B, and that's what this means when you take the, the bar off the top, you're saying the distance from A to B, right, is equal to the distance from C to D. That's the definition of congruent segments. That's what being a congruent segment means. That it's the same distance from here to here as it is from here to here, okay? So that's the definition of congruent segments. Now I can switch them around because of the symmetric property of equality or the, the re, um, yeah, symmetric property of equality or even the, the uh, uh, reflexive property of equality, right? This this represents exactly the same thing as this represents. I can put them in opposite orders. Symmetric property of equality. And then I go back through the definition of congruent segments, and I just now add the segment indicator and change the sign from equals to congruent. And that's the definition of congruent segments. So this segment is congruent to that. Their measures are the same. I can write the measures in any order I want. And hey, look, they're congruent. Okay, so it's a very simple proof. Um, and things like this you'll have to do, even though it's a way simple proof, but that's okay. Um, be, be familiar with this method of thinking. It's going to happen over and over again. Here's another one. 
given that segment LM is congruent to segment PQ, prove that segment LP is congruent to MQ. So here's what they've told us. This little short segment and this little short segment are congruent. Now we want to know that this longer segment is congruent to this longer segment. So think about this with me. Think about this in terms of the um, the, the property of addition, the symmetric property of addition, where if you have A and B that are equal, and you add C to it, A plus C must be the same as B plus C. Okay, so if I have two things that are the same, and I add the same thing to those things that are the same, then they're still the same. And that's the logic we're going to use here, right? I have that LM and PQ are the same. And I'm going to add MP to both of them because this was the same and then I'm adding this. This was the same and then I'm adding this, right? So that's the logic, that's the pathway I'm going to take. Let's do the proof together. LM is congruent to PQ. Here's my diagram again. That's given. Okay. So I'm going to again say that the measurement distances are the same. And that's just the definition of congruent segments. I've taken the segment indicator off and I've changed the sign from uh, an equal sign, sorry, from a congruent signal symbol to an equal symbol. Okay. The distance measurements are the same. Then I'm going to say that MP, this little thing, is itself. And this is a weird statement that you have to make. Like, really, that's the same thing? Yeah, because you're going to use it twice. So you have to say both times I use this, I mean the same thing. Okay? It is itself, that's reflexive. Reflexive property of equality. Now, I'm going to say LM plus MP equals MP plus PQ. This thing plus this is the same as this thing plus the same thing, right? Equals, adding the same thing, they're still the same. This is like solving an algebra x over here um, and is equal to x plus 3 and you subtract both 3 from both sides or you add something to both sides of the equation that's what you're doing here you're adding the same thing to both sides of that equation okay so that is the addition property of equality or the symmetric addition property is another way that it can be written but you're adding the same thing to both sides okay um, so now I have that they're the same so I'm gonna just state that LM plus MP is LP. LM plus MP is LP. And uh, PM plus PQ equals MQ. That's just segment addition, right? And I'm, I'm using the definition of betweenness, that these things add up to this. Um, I am fine in these situations if you say segment addition. That means exactly the same thing, okay? And now I have this statement, is equal to this, this statement is equal to this, and I, on my last slide, I showed that these two statements are equal to each other. So if this is equal to this, which is equal to this, which is equal to this, then these two are the same, right? And that is the transitive. Um, it's also a substitution, but transitive also works, okay? So I am, I'm using a statement of equalities to get back to these things are equal to each other. But this whole time I've been talking about distance measurements, I have to now go back to segments. So I'm just gonna back through the statement of definition of congruence um, and say now if their measurements are the same, then the segments are congruent, okay? If you need to see that proof again, go ahead and rewind the video. Um, but otherwise, that is it. We've done three proofs together. You're going to do a truckload of them in class with your neighbor and with me. And it's going to be this wonderful, proven moment. I'm looking forward to it. If you have any questions, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Until then, God bless you. Jesus loves you. And so do I. Have a good night.